So yeah, now I'm recording and I can see the microphone input is working, so hooray for that. So yes, welcome back folks. Uh, I realized after class on Tuesday that although I had made a recording, it had no audio to it because my microphone had gotten disconnected and I didn't uh, switch it back to that source. So yesterday morning I recorded a, the lecture basically that I gave in class again to the best of my ability to recall what I said. So for those of you who weren't able to attend, you will get a slightly different version, but it's covering the same stuff, that way we're all on the same page. It is the point in the semester where I want to play Let's Make a Deal. Who's willing to play Let's Make a Deal with me? You're going to like the deal. It's a good deal. Okay, so it's course evaluation time. And you should have gotten an email over the weekend letting you know that course evaluations through the university are available. So here's deal number one. As you can see, the, this class has had four people complete them already. Thank you very much, out of 21. And if you look at my response rates in all the other semesters, they're pretty good. In particular, fall 2020, 100% in both classes. Do you know why that is? Hmm? Uh, do you know why, why the response rates are generally pretty good, though? Oh, because of the extra credit. Because I give people extra credit for doing it. That is right. Yes, I will share my screen. Thank you for reminding me. So yeah, here's my deal. If at least, let's see, get back to this semester, if there's 21 of you in this class, if at least 20 of you complete a university evaluation, the entire class gets a point of extra credit, like a percentage point added to your score. That's deal number one. Deal number two is the university course evaluations are quite generic. The number of evaluations are used to help evaluate faculty the qualitative comments are not used as much, but since they're sort of generic, it's sometimes not as helpful to the instructor. So to supplement the university course evaluations, I have made a Qualtrics survey. Each of you is going to be getting an email later today with a custom link to the survey. And I will give anyone who completes that survey before the end of finals week another point of extra credit. So you can add up to two percentage points to your grade by providing feedback about your experience in the class. I take your feedback seriously, and so I want to um, reward slash encourage slash compensate you for the amount of time that it takes outside of class to, to do these sorts of evaluative activities. Um, the way that it works, of course, these course evaluations, I won't be able to see until literally Christmas. So 1225, Merry Christmas, your students hate you. Here's your report, uh, hopefully not. But I do want comments, positive, negative, particularly suggestions. So if there's things that, that you would think would help move the class along or things to do instead, um, I'm always looking for new ideas. The Qualtrics survey is anonymous in that your email address is not tied to your responses. But I can see which emails have completed a survey. So that way I can give you your point but not know necessarily who said what. Those I tend not to look at until after I turn in grades and until these evaluations come back and then I download everything at the same time. So um, if you need me to resend the invitation after, uh, after today, I'm happy to do that as well. So just let me know. So those are my deals. Are those good deals? I think they're good deals. Yeah. All right. Um, in terms of work that is still outstanding this semester, you have one more formative assessment that's due Monday night. Good. The thumbs for the good deals. Excellent. And I tried my best to get your homework ready to t for today for your last homework, but R is not cooperating. It is giving me different variance components than what SAS and Stata are giving me. So I have to try to figure out how to reconcile that um, or otherwise deal with that situation because it's continuing to happen. So um, I will let you know as soon as your last homework is available. It is my intent to have it up as soon as possible. That way you have as much time to work on it as you wish. It will be due at the very end of finals week. And there's that, and that's it. There's no more finals, no, no nothing. Yeah? What's the content for the formative assessment? Formative assessment is uh, two story problems. Okay. So the, the idea of you play the consultant. Um, someone comes to you with a data set and some questions, and you, I'm asking you to help figure out what the model needs to look like. 
So depending on how, how much time we have um, left in example 7b, I do want to get that finished first before we do story time. So I may not go over the formative assessment until Thursday, depending on how the timing shakes out. But I'll make it due on Monday like usual so that there's no confusion. Okay. Any questions on any of that stuff? All right, then I will shut that down. Bring back up example 7b, where we were looking at uh, piecewise slopes models, adding time invariant predictors. Any of that that you want to review in terms of what we covered last time? Any questions you want to ask about any of that? No? Feeling relatively OK? So just a, a very quick recap of what we've seen so far. The first model that we examined on Tuesday, or that I re-talked about on uh, yesterday morning, was an unconditional model, meaning the only parameters in it are with respect to time. So modeling fixed and random slopes for time, potentially modeling any additional residual covariances or heterogeneity of variance that we need, although none in this particular case. And the purpose of starting with this model is because the U variances here, these random effect variances in the level two model, these are as large as they're going to be. So this is our new baseline with which to judge effect size in terms of how much variance our fixed effects of predictors have accounted for. One new piece um, that goes into this that I showed was the idea of creating a fixed effect predicted outcome. So I have given you the equation right here that directly provides how that y hat is computed. It's only from the fixed intercept and the two fixed slopes. So then I can take this y hat predicted outcome, correlate it with the real outcome, square that correlation, and that I call total r square. So that's a general measure of effect size in terms of how well your model is able to predict the outcome. You can then have more specific indices of effect size via pseudo r square, how well is each distinct variance component explained by the fixed effects that are targeting it? And so the code to generate that, that fixed effect column, it's the out PM statement in SAS. So that creates a new data set that has a predicted column in it. In Stata, it is the predict function. And after predict is the name of the column that contains that. And the default is just to use the fixed effects. And in R, it was also called predict, where I have reform equals NA, meaning do not use the random effects. The reason that we don't use the random effects, we talked about last time, but just to remind you, random effects conceptually are still error terms. We know that each person needs their own intercept and slopes, but we don't know why. So it doesn't make sense to include the random effects if your goal is to describe explained variants that you know why. So to me, that is a different animal when random effects are included, and I'm not interested in that at the moment. So we get our parameter estimates from this model, and we have two slopes, early practice, later practice, a rate of change from slope sessions one to two, and then another rate of change from two to six. We then included age as a level two time invariance between person characteristic because this study happened over a two-week period in which people should not be aging. So I have three distinct fixed effects of age in here, a main effect and two interactions, one with each slope for change over time. I have three different effects of age because I have three different types of between-person variants for age to predict. U0 intercept variance, U1 initial slope variance, and U2 later slope variance. So each fixed effect then is targeting the U that is in its level two equation. Because the latter two fixed effects are two-way interactions, I also wanted to show you the ingredients for how you would compute simple slopes within those interactions for any level of the moderating predictor. So more generally in these simple slope equations, the way that you form them is to ask yourself, what slope do I want to find? Go into the equation and find all the terms that have that variable in it, factor that variable out, and then what's left is how the simple slope would be formed by any level of the moderator. So age, for instance, starts with the main effect of age, which given that these two terms would drop if they're zero, 
That means that the main effective age is specifically at time zero, which is session one here. And to talk about how the effective age changes during the study, we would fill in the values of time that we use to code these slopes. So I have a bunch of code here designed to give you examples to follow on how to do that in practice. So estimating to change slopes for different ages, then estimating age slopes at different occasions as the other half of that. And each package has a way to do that with more or less code. One thing I will say is that in R, these types of statements here where I'm estimating simple slopes can be done more simply using packages for simple slopes. So I know of a couple, but just putting, but just using those packages doesn't really describe what's happening under the hood. So once you get good at this and you're tired of writing everything out manually, then go use the packages to save yourself some typing. But I'm deliberately not showing that to you because I want you to know how to do this yourself and not to have to rely on something else that someone else has already programmed. So then in this model, we went through the output last time. The idea of a reference a value for the intercept, same principle, but given the interactions of age with the slopes, we would talk about this as a reference growth curve, not just a reference intercept value. So the intercept and the main effects of slope 1, 2, and 2, 6 are all specifically for an 80-year-old. The effects of age then target each of these. So the main effect moves the intercept. Older people start out higher, which means they're slower. The age interaction by slope 1, 2 makes slope 1, 2's effect more negative. So as age increases, the slope becomes stronger. The same thing happens for slope 2, 6 by age. However, these latter two interactions are not considered significant. In terms of effect size, we can talk about a couple different things. First is total R square. So the first column here is the R between the Y hat that's predicted by the model and the actual one. The second column is the square of that. And then the third column is the difference between models. So all in all, the effects of age, those three slopes working together, explained another 7% of the overall variance in response time. And that is a significant change in the R-square, as given by this wall test F value right here for the three slopes working together. More specifically then, pseudo R-square, I computed that using my macro program. So the formula for pseudo R-square is what it was minus what it is now divided by what it was. So that gives you the proportion reduction, which is given in the last column. So 10% of the intercept variance was explained by age, about 2% of the first slope variance, and less than 1% of the second slope variance. And none of the residual, because there was nothing in the model that should have explained the residual. The, co the uh, interactions of age by slopes should have explained the slope variance, because each of them had a random slope variance to be explained. Ta-da! That's where we were. Any questions before we keep going? Cool. Then let's throw in reasoning. So here's my rationale. Even though age was only significant as a main effect, so in terms of the results, I'm keeping all three of these. Here's my rationale. If I want to be able to say that I'm looking at the effects of my other predictors after controlling for H, that sentence needs to be described in more detail in multi-level models than you would in single-level models. So what do I mean by control for H? If I were thinking of this from just a regular single-level regression angle, I would say, well, I'm controlling for age right here, right? I put age in the model, I've controlled for it, the end. But if I just had this main effect of age, what specifically have I controlled for age? Fixed well, the fixed effect of age is controlling for age, but what is it? Con what, what what part of the model or what part of the trajectory is being controlled? The intercept. The intercept. Yeah. The I'll take the mean or the intercept. Um, it becomes conditional on session one 
only when these interactions are here. But either way, it's, it's a shift in y. So if all I had was this main effect of age, I've controlled the intercept for age. I have not controlled change for age. I have not controlled the practice effects for age. So to be able to fully control every aspect of the trajectory, I'm leaving these non-significant terms in here. Otherwise, I've sort of controlled for age, but not fully, and I don't want to have to explain that. So there are situations in which leaving in non-significant terms can make the interpretations more straightforward and more defensible. Because if I leave these terms in here, there's no way that reviewer two is going to come back and say, well, did you see if they became significant later on or something like that? So I'm leaving it all here. I am going to throw in reasoning. So level one model stays the same. Reasoning is going into the level two model right here. So the first term of reasoning is labeled gamma O2. Do you remember how the subscripts work? Or do you want to go over that again? Go over it again? Or maybe? Okay. So the first subscript is which beta in level one? So in the line predicting beta zero, every term has a zero in the first place because it goes with beta zero. In the line predicting beta one, every term has a one to start with. The second term is the order of the predictor within its level two equation. So age in predicting the intercept is gamma O one because age is the first predictor of beta zero. Reasoning is the second predictor of beta zero. If I had a third one here, what would it be? O3. Yeah, O3. So you can kind of think of it as like a grid, like rows and columns, so to speak, where the rows are the betas and the columns then are the variables. Uh, I have centered reasoning at 22, which was near the mean for the variables, so that my reference person would be someone of average fluid intelligence. That's what this variable is supposed to be a proxy for. Here's my fixed effect predicted outcome. And here are then the simple slopes that that equation implies. So slope 1, 2 is now conditional on both age and reasoning, meaning that people of different ages and people of different reasonings, the model expects them to have a different slope 1, 2. Same is true for slope 2, 6. Taking the same idea and turning it on its side, age and reasoning then are both conditional on time. So we can talk about the moderation of the growth curve by age and reasoning, or we could think about how the effects of age and reasoning change during the study. Either one of those is, is as correct as the other. Which way you would explain it in practice uh, is based on the context of what your questions are and how people would typically talk about such things. I think it's more convenient in most cases for these types of models to think of the level two predictors as the moderator, because what they're doing is moderating the growth curve or the decline lines, as it were here. Okay, any questions on the model or the notation? Uh, note that age and reasoning both have I's and they don't have T's. Coincidence or consequence? Consequence. Consequence, why is that a consequence? They're time yeah, they're time invariant. So they don't have a T because they don't vary by time. In contrast, any variable that is time varying gets a T and an I, and it would go into the level one equation instead. All right. So then it's just a question of adding those terms to the code as fixed effects. I now have two different wall tests, one for the three effects of age, one for the three effects of reasoning. I've got the simple slopes as a function of reasoning plus or minus one standard deviation, which was about five in this variable. In Stata, same idea, adding in the three reasoning slopes right there, using a test statement to get their combined F test, and then asking for simple slopes as a function of differing levels of reasoning, as well as effects of reasoning at different points in time. Asking for some pictures, asking for total R square to be printed for me, 
Same thing in R, although the code gets a little bit uh, trickier. Do you remember how, how to know how to fill in these things? The order of the predictor. The order of the fixed effects. And is it the order that you write it or the order that it writes it for you? Yeah, it's, it's, it's its order. So I have it in the order in which it appears in my output. If you wrote it in a different order, you'd want to compare against your output to see what that order is because that's the order in which these have to be listed. So we need as many values as you have model fixed effects. If you don't want that fixed effect included in whatever you're trying to estimate, it goes to zero. Otherwise, you put in the multiplier that corresponds to this type of equation here, whatever you're trying to estimate, simple slopes or predicted outcomes. So I've got two different contest MDs here. That's creating my two F tests, where I'm lumping together the three age slopes in the first one, and then lumping together the three reasoning slopes in the second one. Lisa? Yeah. Why are you testing age against why am I doing it again? Yes. Uh, why not? Because I could. You don't have to. But if you want to talk about, um, for instance, whether age still matters after controlling for reasoning, then you would want a, an F-test to support that statement, something like that. Okay. Yeah, a lot of hypotheses in model building is, like, what still matters after controlling for what is often a question, and so having these things built into the code can help you answer such incremental prediction questions. And predicted values, total R-square, and change in R-square relative to the previous model. All right, let's see what we get. So the model for the variance has not changed. We have reduced the amount of variance potentially by explaining it with reasoning, but we haven't reallocated anything. So we're still dealing with a seven-parameter model for the variance, three random effect variances, three random effect covariances, and one residual variance assumed constant. So here are my fixed effects here. So a couple questions to help us go through these. Which fixed effects are conditional on age? When I go through this list, which of these do I have to say, like, for an 80-year-old? This one? Yeah. Yeah? This one? Yeah. This one? Yeah. This one? Mmm. No. No. Cough, cough, homework question. The effect of age is not conditional on age 80. It would be if I had a quadratic term in there, though. 80 is just the reference point. But this slope would be the same if I centered at 75 or if I centered at 85 or anything. Same with these two interactions. They are not conditional on age. They are conditional on time. So basically these, you have, we have to talk about this is the effective age on that slope, this is the effective age on that slope. Analogously, which are conditional on reasoning? Is the intercept? Yep, because of this term. How about slope one, two? Is it conditional on reasoning? I would say yes. Yep, because of that one. Slope two, six? Yeah. Yep, because of that one. How about the effect of age? No. Nope, not yet. <laughs> nope. So because age and reasoning themselves don't interact, this slope, of eight, this slope of age is for any level of reasoning. It's just conditional at the first occasion. Likewise, this slope of reasoning is for any age, not conditional on age. In terms of the patterns, then, let's see what reasoning does. So let's do that one. Reasoning moderating the intercept. Who's feeling brave? Put the slope of reasoning in a sentence for me. The coefficient is minus 27 milliseconds. And Zoomers, you can play along too. I'm watching the chat. So, 
This is just the, the main effect of reasoning we're talking about here. What it applies to is the intercept, which is why I had highlighted that. But this is just a slope. So for every? For every unit increase in reasoning, mm -hmm. intercept, it, it subtracts 27 from the intercept. Yep, the intercept is lower by 27. And the intercept is the expected outcome at the first occasion, given our slopes coding. So you could either help your reader remember what intercept is by saying it's at the first occasion, or you could just say intercept if you've already said that enough times where they should be able to follow you. And given the p-value, we'd say, yeah, that's significant. So people who did better on this reasoning test start out faster. That's what it means in English. How about slope 1, 2 by reasoning? Which pattern is this? Reasoning does what to slope 1, 2? More positive, less positive, more negative, less negative? More negative. More negative. Stronger or weaker then? Stronger. Stronger, yep. And, but not significantly. How about slope 2, 6 by reasoning? Less negative. Less negative. Stronger or weaker? Yeah. Weaker. So people improve less if they have better reasoning. And that one is significant by conventional standards. So given this pattern of results where the main effect is significant, the interaction with the first slope is not, but the interaction with the second slope is, I would keep all three. Because it's, it cleans up the interpretation. Otherwise, if you left that out, then this effective reasoning would have to apply to both sessions one and two. So you'd end up with some kind of uh, like intermediate value between these two as a consequence, and it may not be significant. So I don't like lumping stuff together if it looks like it shouldn't be lumped. So I would keep all three of these for interpretation purposes so that I can say reasoning is related to where you start. It is not related to your initial rate of change, but it is related to your subsequent rate of change. Something like that. So given this pattern, which of my random effect variances do you think are going to be reduced relative to the previous model with age in it only? Level two. Level two, but which, there's three of them. The three. We've, we've got intercepts, yes. slope one, two variance, yeah. and slope two, six variance. Which ones of those do you think are going to be reduced? reduced? Yeah, based on this pattern. Mm. Uh, that's the, yeah. So each of these has a different job to play, right, in terms of which variance it's targeting. And that's the way I think about it. It's like when you put a predictor into a model, you should know what it's for. When I put reasoning 22 in by itself, I'm targeting the intercept. So if that effect is significant, then the corresponding effect size would be the random intercept variance reduction. This interaction term is targeting which variance component? Random slope? Which random slope? Four. Yeah, one, two. Four. Yeah, you got to be very careful to make sure that you have enough adjectives to keep track of everything that's going on. The slope is not enough in this context because we got two of them. But yeah, because this one is not significant, I would expect very little change in that variance component. Whereas the last one, that's targeting the other slope variance, and I would expect more of a change. Let's see what we got in that regard. Here's a picture. So this is the kind of thing that can help your reader keep track of what the overall picture is that's being created by your effects. So in this graph, I made it in Excel so that you could see how I made it specifically. The x-axis is time. And I have separate lines for different types of people. 
So word to the wise, be very careful when you're explaining graphs like this to indicate that you did not cut up your predictor. Because I've had reviewers multiple times comment that did I divide them so that like I did a median, like a three-way split and I made it 17 and 22 and 27. Is that how I made the picture? No, it is not. I just plugged in these values as examples of what low would look like relative to the distribution of this variable. So low is minus one standard deviation relative to the mean, which is about 17 for a score. A mid-level person would be about a 22, and plus one standard deviation would be a 27. So you could call these like prototypical values or, you know, uh, example values, but something that conveys the idea that this is still being treated as a quantitative predictor. You're not grouping people artificially. So the people who are the lowest in reasoning are in the circles, and they are the highest here, because people who are lower in reasoning start out higher. The people who are highest in reasoning start out faster. The fact that the initial line here from session one to two is nearly parallel is an illustration of the lack of significance of the age by slope one, two interaction. The non-parallel lines that you can see when you go from two to six across the three lines here, that's illustrating the age by slope two, six interaction, which slope two, six is weaker. It is less negative for the triangle people who have the high reasoning relative to the circle people who have the low reasoning. In this picture, I have held age constant at 80 because it wouldn't change the point of the picture. It would only change the y-axis. The effects of reasoning are not conditional on age in this model. In terms of effect size, reasoning picked up another 5% of the variance overall. And in terms of specific effect size, look what happened. And no, this is not a typo. About 5% of the intercept variance, negative 0.1%, the variance went up. That's what that means. Residual variance also went up a tiny bit, like in the eighth decimal place or something. Yes, that can happen. So this is one of the criticisms of pseudo R square is that particularly for non-significant effects, the variance can actually wiggle up instead of down. The same thing happens, by the way, if you use adjusted R square and linear regression, which is based on the MSE term as opposed to the, the total and model sums of squares. So the alternative way of computing these types of specific R squares for each type of variance uh, that's described in Wrights and Sturba, rather than using a baseline model, they try to compute what the, the marginally predicted variance would be from the same model, and that helps to alleviate these negative R squares. So I would say it accounted for zero variance in the, that case. But, it, but the negative value does mean that it goes up. So if that happens on your homework, put it as negative, because that's what happens. How are we doing? Not bad, right? How about a grouping variable? So earlier in the data wrangling section of the program, I wanted to show the effect of a grouping predictor, but I didn't have one in this data set, so I made one. I cut up education and years into three categories for demonstration purposes only. I want to draw your attention, though, to the disconnect in how I'm thinking about education as a unitary variable and how many fixed effects it actually takes to represent it. If I want to allow education, which has three groups, and I'm treating it as a nominal variable, if I want to allow education to predict the intercept in each slope, how many fixed effects do I need and don't say three? If I have three groups, I, then I have two terms, right, to represent the three groups. And if I want to have those two terms predict the intercept and each slope, how many have I added? 
altogether. What's three times two? There we go. <laughs> I swear I'm not trying to trick you. It really is that obvious when I ask such questions. So that's what gamma 03 and 04, 13 and 14, and 23 and 24 are doing in here. And I have labeled these to convey what that slope is contrasting. So I have it set up as the SAS default in which the highest category is the reference. So high education versus low is what's going to be given by the first contrast. High versus medium is given by the second. What if I wanted to get low versus medium? Could I do that? Yep, it's a linear combination of those two. It's literally the difference between them. Uh, I see, I call these contrasts because that's like what they represent, but they're still just slopes. So in each of these slopes, there is a reference group and there is an alternative group where the reference group is the zero and the alternative is the one. And each of these slopes says how the one group differs from the zero group in whatever term we're predicting. So like gamma O3 here is going to tell me how the low group differs from the high group in its intercept. Gamma 1, 3 is going to tell me how the low group differs from the high group in its slope 1, 2. So this is another type of situation in which knowing how to lump the contrasts back together again would be useful. Because if I want to know if education predicts the intercept, there's three different pairwise comparisons that are relevant to answering that question. But the omnibus effect of education requires lumping two of them together. So this may or may not be provided for you based on your software. It depends on whether you let the software do the coding so that it understands that those are contrasts within the same variable as a factor. In my case, I coded them myself so that it, um, I think, did I code them myself? No, I didn't. I did let SAS do the coding so that you could see what that would look like as a factor variable. So it's going to give me those, a lumping together of, of 0, 3, and 0, 4 as one effect 1, 3, and 1, 4 as a second, and 2, 3, and 2, 4 as a third. Then we get into uh, all of the fixed effect outcomes. So here is the model then without the beta placeholders, which gives us the ingredients then for forming all the simple slopes. So slope 1, 2 is now conditional on age, reasoning, and education, as is slope 2, 6. Age is now conditional on time. Reasoning is conditional on time. Education is conditional on time. And then here's the last missing contrast where we would take one of these rows basically and subtract the other to get to the difference. So here then, going by piece by piece, education group is the name of this predictor. I put it on the class statement in SAS, which means, hey, can you make those dummy codes for me? Cool, thanks. So that means when I write education group, it understands that I want two contrasts that differentiate the three groups, and it sets the highest coded or last alphabetically as the reference. So this one word is two things. Likewise, the education by slope interactions are each two things because it understands that to fully represent differences by education, it requires two slopes to do so every time it's being used. So here's a bunch of examples on how what might, one might do with grouping variables like this. So I'm asking for predicted means for each of my education groups, say at the, at the first occasion and the last occasion, just as an example. I'm asking for all possible pairwise comparisons. So in SAS, it's minus 1 and 1 to do contrast within a variable like this, where the minus 1 is the reference and the 1 is the alternative. So if I'm just listing the first effect of education, then these are contrasts for the intercept specifically. If I list the interaction terms, then these are differences between groups in the slopes instead. Okay. I tend not to use the class state statement as much because I like to code things myself, but if you have a lot of groups, then this becomes a lot easier than coding everything yourself. In SATA, 
we are doing I dot instead of C dot. That's how you tell Stata that you want the variable to be coded as if it were categorical. Where B last then means, can you change the baseline category to the last? Okay, thanks, because by default it's the first. So I have IB last for group by itself and then as part of each interaction with time so that I can see if education moderates the rates of change. I have the same adjusted means at the beginning of the study and at the end of the study, as well as pairwise comparisons. And then I'm also using test statements to get pairwise comparisons for the intercepts and the slopes. And in R, <laughs> I know. I know it hurts my brain too. Yep, this is what it looks like. So I know there's a million ways to do this, but here's what I chose. Factor and then that variable. So you can either denote it as a factor variable in the data set, or you can do it within the model code. I just did it within the model code in this case. That way I didn't have to change anything about the data. But yeah, now we got a whole list of zeros and ones. So this, this is the test of age. This is the test of reasoning. And then I have that one. That one's not so bad. The ANOVA function allows you to lump back together the contrasts that mean the same thing across your groups. So like the two contrasts of education on the intercept will become one F test. The two contrasts on each slope will become a second and a third. Then I lump together all six for an omnibus test of education in the whole model. I found uh, some new code relative to our other examples using EM means that I can use to get predicted means per education group. So I did that at the beginning of the study and at the end of the study. And then here are the pairwise contrasts for the effects of education on the uh, intercept and slopes. That doesn't look right. One of these needs to be a one. Yep, there, one of these is wrong. Some of these are wrong. It looks like I need to fix it because there should be a one to go with the negative ones and there's not. Yep, I will fix that, track that error down and fix it. It's probably right in the online code. It just didn't get, it means I screwed it up and didn't change it into the spots. But every line should have a minus one and a one if you're gonna do differences. And then last but not least, our square stuff. All right, so then in terms of the output, the solution for fixed effects is going to give us zero values for the reference, and then it will tell us what the difference is for each of the other categories. So the main effect of education for here, for instance, that is right here, education group three's, th three's intercept. The 25 then is how group 2 differs from 3, and the minus 41 is how group 1 differs from 3. So then if I wanted to know what is the difference among these two, I'd have to subtract them, and that's what the one of the myriad statements are doing down below. However, if I scroll down my p-value column, looks like there's not a whole lot here to see. Here are the results of the ANOVA type tests where you're lumping back together the contrast for each uh, type of education slope. So as a main effect on the intercept, as an interaction with slope 1-2 and slope 2-6, none of those are significant as well. Here are my pairwise comparisons. Not a one of them is significant, so it looks like, yeah, education really doesn't matter in part of the story. And here are predicted means holding the covariates that are quantitative constant at these values as specified. Ta-da! And education picked up another 1% of the variance for all six of those fixed effects. And a bunch of negative pseudo R squares. So yeah, when you add bad stuff to your model that it doesn't want, variance can go up. It will happen. Shouldn't go up by like a ton, but it can wiggle its way up. So it looks like we don't need education as part of the story. All right, how are we doing? Zoomers, how are you doing? You've been quiet today. 
There's a thumb. Two thumbs. Well, to be fair, you're always quiet, but I count the chat window as talking, so. Are you ready for a challenge? Three-way interactions? You think we can handle it on a Thursday? I think we can handle it. So I'm taking out education and I'm adding in what I would call a level two interaction between age and reasoning. So I call it level two because those are both level two predictors. I'm also adding in cross-level interactions of age by reasoning by each slope, which yes, those are three-way interactions. Has anyone had to deal with a significant three-way interaction in their research before or in a class before? You have? How, how did it go? Um, how the interaction went or how it was? How, how was the process of trying to figure out what the hell you were looking at? Uh, that was very difficult. <laughs> it was also like a lot earlier in my training. Mm -hmm. um, I had no idea what I was doing. And my advisor was even like, yeah, people don't really like three-way interactions, but you can make this easier with some two-way interactions that would, like just focusing on a two-way interaction that would be better. Mm -hmm. I mean, ultimately, like, ultimately we put it in the paper. That's and good. And reviewers also didn't like it. <laughs> Okay, so the, the story was a student here had a three-way interaction as part of their story, but ended up dropping it to simplify the story because they, they can be scary. Yes, indeed. Uh, coding is okay, but interpretation will be hard. It can be, but if you stick to the same basic premise of there's only four kinds, more positive, less positive, more negative, less negative, that's it. It applies to this too. So I don't want you to be afraid of three-way interactions anymore. When I was a graduate student, I pre presented my master's thesis, one, one of the first conferences I ever went to, and it had a three-way interaction in it. And there was one person who came up to me at my poster session, which coincidentally was happy hour. So there was like people with, you know, beers and stuff at the poster session. And he's like, a three-way interaction, huh? What's it mean? And I told him, and he's just like, oh, okay and just walked away. Like, like, that was the whole thing. He just wanted to hear me explain the three-way interaction. It can be done. It can. So I don't want you to fear these anymore. So yeah, the coding, not so bad. The interpretation is tricky. But what three-way interactions do is modify the two-way interactions. The two-way interactions then modify the main effects. So everything sort of trickles downhill. Here's what the giant equation looks like once we put in the two-way interaction of age by reasoning as well as the three-way interaction of age reasoning by each of the slopes. Then the simple slopes, I have simple slopes for each of the change slopes age and reasoning, and those are each described by main effects of the other variables as well as the two-way interaction, because in order to have a three-way interaction you have to have all of the lower order terms. But then we also have a concept that technically would be called a simple slope of a two-way interaction. And at that point, I don't think it's fair to use the word simple. That's just a misnomer. It's like a difficult interaction, not a simple one, right? But from the terminology of conditional, it does still apply. So like, for instance, these two-way interactions of age by the change slopes are conditional on reasoning. The two-way interaction of reasoning by the change slopes are conditional on age. And the two-way interaction of age by reasoning is conditional on time. So I have examples of how you will get conditional two-way interactions as well as conditional one-way interactions. Uh, may, otherwise known as main effects, in each of the packages. I will double check to make sure that my ones and zeros are all correct on that, but it's the same, same principle as we've been following. So we've got uh, the 
each of these is, let's see, these are first, these are the simple slopes of age, the simple slopes of reasoning, and then simple interactions. Okay, we can do this. Let's go this one. We'll start with these ones. So we'll warm up with the two ways. And I don't care if these are significant or not. I want you to know what to do with the numbers. Fair? Even if you're hoping that it's non-significant, so you don't have to explain it. So we have a positive main effective age. That's conditional at the first occasion and for reasoning 22. The age by reasoning does what to that 22 as reasoning increases? Less positive. Yeah, less positive. Uh, the, going the other way, the slope of reasoning is minus 28 for an 80-year-old. What does age do to it as it increases? More negative. More negative. Makes it stronger. So reasoning matters more if you're old. Is what I would say. Something like that. Matters more is a good way to describe an effect that has been strengthened. Otherwise, you can get out the GRE words that you studied and then promptly forgot. Um, you know, you can, you can think of words like uh, exacerbated or risk factors or dampening factors. Like, you can, you can pull all the English out that you want to to try and describe these things if more positive, less positive, etc. is not going to be reader-friendly. Let's try that one, that one, and that one. So we start at the top. Slope 1, 2 means people improve from, from session 1 to 2. That's for an 80-year-old with reasoning 22. People who are older improve more or less? More. More. Okay, people who improve, who people who are older improve more. Now we pick up this one. So if we just look at this as one slope and it's negative, what's this one doing to it? Damping, Dampening it, making it less negative. So minus eight describes older people changing more, but the extent to which older people change more is dampened if you're smart. Older people change less more if they have higher reasoning. <laughs> I know that sounds crazy, but that, I think that actually works grammatically. So yeah, dampening, diminishing, reducing, you can, you can talk about what is happening to the slopes this way. If we went the opposite direction, so people improve, okay, got that. Uh, if you're smarter, do you improve more or less at first? More. more. But less more if you're old. <laughs> How about the other slope? Let's do that one. <clears throat> I think this is, let's actually, let's, let's do a different pattern. Let's do this one, these two. Okay, so people improve after session two. People who are smarter improve more or less? Less. less. More or less. More or less. Yep. People who are smarter improve more or less if they're old. <laughs> Now, what kind of picture would I want to make with this? I would go two two-way interactions. And I would probably do an x-axis of, of time, if you want to show the effect of the slopes. And you might have, like, a low reasoning plot and a high reasoning plot. And inside the plot would be, like, different lines for different ages. Or you could have a young plot and an old plot with different lines for different reasonings. And so then you would focus on how, like, basically the difference in the parallelness of, of the lines. Like, like, these lines on the right plot are more spread out than the lines on the left plot. That means the effect is bigger 
as a function of a higher level of this moderator, something like that. So it's not so bad. If you hang on to the root that the three-way interaction is adjusting is one of the two ways as a function of the third variable, then it's not so bad. So my question then, which fixed effects are conditional on age? Intercept, is it conditional on age? Yeah. These are softballs. Here we go. Is this one conditional on age? Yeah. How about this one? Yeah. Yep. How about this one? No. No. How about this one? No. Nope. Nope. How about that one? Uh, I would say yes. Yes, it is. Reasoning, the slope of reasoning is conditional on age because of that interaction right there. Likewise, uh, is slope 1, 2 by reasoning 22 conditional on age? Yep, so. because of that one. So slope 1, 2 by reasoning 22 is specific to an 80-year-old. Likewise, that two-way interaction is conditional on age 80 as well because of the three-way. And if I went from the opposite perspective, what's conditional on reasoning? All of that because of the interaction terms down here. Now, why does that matter? Is because I see people trying to interpret only the coefficients that are given by default and forgetting that they are only true for certain kinds of people or certain occasions. So I can't say reasoning matters for everybody, for every occasion, because this is a very specific, like, what's the word I want? Slice of, like, the overall data set. This is the effect of reasoning for 80-year-olds at the beginning of the study. But I could figure out what the effect of reasoning would be for, say, an 85-year-old instead, or an 85-year-old at the end. Like, you can come up with, you know, whatever like constellation of points would help you tell your story. And that's what the purpose is of trying to do all of these other follow-up tests, is to help you figure stuff out. So age matters more in predicting the slope in people with lower levels of reasoning, for instance. That is true in both of the slopes. Uh, reasoning in predicting the slope matters more in younger people than in older people. Now, fortunately for us, the three new slopes are not significant individually, nor are they significant as a set. As a set, they accounted for less than 1% of the variance. Now, which, which term is being targeted by each one? Let me go back up to the model here. Age by reasoning, which variance should that have reduced? The intercept. The intercept. Which variance should slope 1, 2 by age by reasoning have reduced? The slope. Yeah, slope 1, 2. 1, 2. Yep. And this one goes with slope 2, 6. That, its variance. What if slope 1, 2 or slope 2, 6 were not random? Uh, residual variance. Residual variance instead. Yep. But we got to check to make sure they're not random first before we throw anything like this in there. So in Chapter 2 of my textbook, I have examples of three-way interactions, pulling them apart, showing in pictures. I think I even attempted a four-way interaction and decided that that was enough. Yeah. One of the things that you mentioned in, in book chapter is that level two effects uh, do not have enough power sometimes to be rejected. Mm -hmm. So it is the same thing here. Can we rely on these p-values for the interactions of level two? I would say to the extent that you're comfortable with the amount of power that like 100 people provides, because that's what's relevant in terms of thinking about power for these, these fixed effects is the number of people. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's important, as always, to supplement any sort of binary significant or not decision with a corresponding effect size.
and preferably even a confidence interval for your effect size to describe how imprecisely it might be estimated. So I'm trying to give you a menu of choices. Um, one thing that I haven't done that I could have is taken each of these T values and turned them into to, uh, Ds or Rs. You could also do that too. All right. Yay, we made it. The next set of models is quadratic, but before looking at those, I wanted to point out that as usual, the end of this example handout has words. So I have a results section that goes with all of the models that we looked at this week. So all of the things that I would have said about them and where I would have put the reporting and how I would have talked about it is all right here. So there's, there's many different ways to do it. This is just one example of how I would talk about these things in practice. So that is there as a, a supplement to just the output and such. Okay. Do you believe me the three-way interactions are not so bad? Mm -hmm. If you start, if you just build it like layer by layer, then it's not so bad. If you try to do it as... As age goes up and reasoning goes up and time goes up, this happens? Like, no, that, that, that strategy does not work. Three-way interactions modify the two-way interactions, which in turn modify the main effects, which in turn move the intercept. Do, 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 do. All right, I think that's a good place to stop for this week, don't you? Is anyone going to be sad if I let you out like seven minutes early? I did not think so. All right. Then that will be all for now. Please work on your course evaluations so that you can get some extra credit for yourself and your classmates. I will let you know when your last homework is available, but in the meantime, you can work on your last formative assessment. And we will pick this up next week. Cool. Thanks for being here, folks. Let me know if you need anything. Otherwise, peace out. <laughs>